and, and just getting there and, and turning there. Uh, the Book of Acts is a wonderful book. It, it, there's so much in it, and, and it's so interesting. And, and some have said that, that the Book of Acts is an accurate record of the organization of the church. And it really it is, because it tells us how the church began, and, and, and it tells us you know, how, how the church formed. And, and in Acts chapter 2, when we see that on the day of Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit came and, and the church began. So, so really, the book of Acts is a record of the organization of the church. Others have said that, that the book of Acts is a discipleship manual for missions. And through that book, we, we see so many avenues where, where God shows us the mission of the church and, and how we're to respond. And, and we see that, that the good news of Jesus Christ, his gospel message, is taught throughout the book of Acts. And, and we see how multitudes come to know Christ in a real and personal way. The, the book begins, the book of Acts kind of begins in Jerusalem. But by about chapter 12 or 13, we see it expanding from Jerusalem to, to the world. And by the time we reach the end, the gospel has went as far as Rome and even farther. So, so we see that manual for missions. And somebody else says, I was looking, you know, what do you think about the book of Acts? Somebody else said, the book of Acts is like a how-to manual for the church. And it really is sad as well because it shows us so many things that, that as a church, as a body of believers, that we should be believing and we should be doing and we should be following. And it, it shows us how to, to do evangelism. Evangelism is that sharing of the gospel. And it begins and says, you know, the gospel was preached and 3,000 people got saved. A few days later, 5,000 people got saved. The good news was preached to kings. It was yeah. preached to the poorest of the poor. Uh, but, but, but we see that manual for evangelism. Another thing we find is that how-to manual to the church is the book of Acts teaches us about fellowship. And as we'll, we'll see it. It talks about the believers. And it says that uh, they, they, they were together and they had all things common. And we see that fellowship of believers in the book of Acts. The book of Acts tells us about the power of prayer. We see a story in there where, where, where some members of the church have been arrested just for, for teaching about Jesus. And, and the church was gathered and praying for them. And the release, and God released them in a miraculous way. And, and, and I think above all else, one of the things we see is we see just that in the book of Acts is that miraculous power that, that God gives to his church through his Holy Spirit. So here's what I want to do. For the next several weeks, we're going to go on a journey through the book of Acts. Now, honestly, we can't look at the whole book of Acts. If we do, we're going to be in the book of Acts this time next year. It would, to, to, to preach everything in the book of Acts, it would take us that long. But, but here, through the summer months, we're going to go on a journey through the book of Acts. And we're going to look at so many things. So many a couple weeks, we kind of take a break and do something different. But, but for the most part, we're going to stick with the book of Acts because I want us to see how the church came to be. I want us to see what the book teaches us about the function of the church. And what we see about the, the mission of the church and how, how Acts teaches us about the, the church growing and, and the purpose of the church. So what I, I call this teaching series the expanding church because we're going to see it grow and grow and grow. So I, I think the best place to begin is to begin the beginning. So, so let's start. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, grab your Bibles if you're in the same Bible that I have, the ones that I give out out there. You're in page 1,785. That makes it easy to find the book of Acts. But here's what verse 1 says. It says, In my first book, Theophilus, I wrote about what Jesus began to do and teach. This included everything from the beginning of his life until the day he was taken to heaven. Before he was taken to heaven, he gave instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his death, Jesus showed the apostles a lot of convincing evidence that he was alive. For 40 days... <coughs> he appeared to them and talked with them about God's kingdom. Once while he was meeting with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for what the Father had promised. Jesus said to them, I've told you what the Father promises. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles came together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus told them, You don't need to know about times or periods that the Father has determined by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. 
Then you will be my witnesses to testify about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken to heaven. A cloud hid him so that they could no longer see him. They were staring into the sky as he departed. Suddenly, two men in white clothes stood near them. They asked, why are you men from Galilee standing here looking at the sky? Jesus, who was taken from you to heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go. Now, as we, we begin the story in, in the verse 1 and in, in 2, it kind of, kind of gives us just the why of the book. And, and it says, in my first book, Theophilus, I wrote about what Jesus had begun to do and teach. This included everything from the beginning of his life until the day he was taken to heaven. Now, what those two sentences does is it takes us and it connects this book, the book of Acts, with the book of Luke. And the reason is, in Luke chapter 1, it says, many, attempt, many have attempted to write about what has taken place among us. They received their information from those who had been eyewitnesses and servants of God's word from the beginning. They passed it on to us. I, too, have followed everything closely from the beginning, so I thought it would be a good idea to write an orderly account for your excellency, Theophilus. In this way, you will know what you've been told is true. So, so what the entire book of Luke, and, and the book of Luke is the longest of all the Gospels, and the entire book of Luke is written so that the Theophilus and anybody else that reads it will know this is the true story of Jesus. Then when we go into Acts, he, he says, you know, I've written about everything of his life on the earth until he was taken up to heaven. So, so what Luke is doing, that makes it, we know Luke is now the author of Acts. And Luke is the one who is writing. And he says, so the author says, I wrote to you about all the things Jesus did while on this earth until he was taken up to heaven. Now I want to tell you the rest of the story. I want to tell you what continued to happen or, or the continuing works of Jesus. So from our passage this morning, as we look at that continuing works of Jesus and his church, I want us to see some of the things that takes place, or, or some of the things that happens. And, and I want us to pull from it four very important things that we need to know about Christ and his church. And the first one we sang about this morning, we, we talked about this morning already, and the first one's very simple one is this, Jesus is alive. It's important, and Luke, Luke begins here by, by reminding Theophilus, Jesus is alive. You know, as we look through history, we, we see a lot of good men. Somewhere around 563 B.C., a man named, and I'm going to totally butcher this, but I'm going to give it my best shot, said Harthia Glatima. Anybody know who that is? Said Harthia Glatima. Somewhere around 563 B.C., he was born. The man would become a great teacher. The me he, he taught a message of peace and a message for a peaceful life. And, and the message he taught, there are still many today who follow his teachings. We don't know him by his real name. We know him as Buddha. But you know, in 486 B.C., from a mysterious illness, Buddha died. Right about that same time, there was another great teacher. Many folks still follow his teachings today. His name was called Kui. He was born, and, and his teaching was also of peace. And he had these sayings, and then they were sayings of peace that, that many still follow and, and worship. Later, he would become known as Confucius. In 479 B.C., Confucius died. And you know, we can go on and on and on with this list, because throughout history, there's been a lot of great teachers. There's been a lot of men with a great message that the people need to hear. But you know, there's only one that, that had something a little different. All of these men, every great teacher in history died. Every single one of them. But you know, Luke wrote in this letter, as he's writing the second letter to the office, he tells about a man who also died. But three days later, rose from the dead. And that man was Jesus. Jesus died just like the rest of them. But, but Jesus, Jesus rose from the dead. You say, well, why is that so important? Well, all of these other guys, all these other great teachers promised their followers great things. 
Many promised them that, that, that you know, if you follow me and, and live the life, you're going to have this or you're going to have that. Well, you know what Jesus promised his followers? He promised them if you believe in me, you will have everlasting life. You'll have eternal life. And so he told all his followers, you follow me and you will have eternal life. Now, all these other guys might have said the same thing. Their message was a message of peace as well. You follow me, you're going to have all these things. But Jesus proved he can deliver. He, he proved to us that when he says, I will give you eternal life, he can deliver that because he died. They made sure he was dead. The soldier pierced his side. The Bible says blood and water come out. We believe by that he went up under the rim and pierced the heart. But three days later, Jesus was alive. Luke tells us, says for, for 40 days that he, he told others about, or showed others he was alive. Verse 3 says, after his death, Jesus showed the apostles a lot of convincing evidence that he was alive. For 40 days he appeared to them and talked with them about God's kingdom. If you read through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to find 10 different appearances of Jesus after he rose from the dead. We have a record of at least 10 different times he appeared to somebody. We know he appeared to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. We know he appeared to Mary and the other ladies. We know he appeared uh, in a room to, to 10 of the apostles. We know he appeared again in the room to 11 of the apostles when Thomas was there. We, we know the story of doubting Thomas. We know from Scripture he appeared to two men who was walking home uh, on the road to Emmaus. We, we know that from Scripture that there was a time when he appeared to over 500 people. <coughs> So Jesus, throughout all that time, was convincing them he was alive. He wasn't a ghost. He, he, he went, when he went into the room, he went in and he said, give me something to eat. He wanted to eat in front of them so they could know that he was alive and he was able to eat. He wasn't just a figment of their imagination. He wasn't just a spirit uh, going through wherever he wanted to go. <coughs> Jesus also challenged one of them to uh, look at his hands. See the nail prints. Take his fingers and stick them into the side where he was pierced and see uh, that, that he was alive. So what Jesus did was he gave them proof, positive proof, that he was alive. So church, as we follow Jesus, we need to know the most important thing. Jesus is alive. <coughs> Excuse me. What he says he will do, what he promises to those who follow him, he can deliver because he is alive. But then Luke goes on in this letter to, to show that there's something else that we need to know as believers. And he tells them that they, need, that they needed to wait on the promise. Jesus taught them there that they were to wait. They were to go back into Jerusalem. Verses 4 and 5 says, once while he was meeting with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for what God the Father had promised. Jesus said to them, I've told you what the Father promises. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now in just a moment, in this passage, Jesus is going to commission them, and he's going to tell them that they're going to go. And, and, but first, they have to wait. They have to wait because the task that he is giving them is far bigger than they can handle. It's far bigger than you and I can handle. We think, oh, this is a modern time and we have technology. And we have, but, but it's a bigger task than any of us can do. So he told me, he said, before you leave, before you do anything else, you need to wait. You ever noticed how hard it is to wait? I don't know, but I don't like to wait. I don't like to wait on the drive through line. I don't like to wait in the checkout line. I don't like to wait behind someone. I mean, we don't like to wait, do we? And even when it comes to spiritual things, we don't like to wait. Often, when there's something going on in our life, when there's a struggle or a problem, we'll try to fix it ourselves rather than wait for what God wants to do. Or we, we try to, to do other things that, that God Tells us, even if we know this is what God wants us to do, this is exactly God's plan. 
We try to change it up because we don't like the wait. I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait on answered prayer. I, I'd really like it if, if I prayed in, in, in Jesus' name, amen, and poof, God did it. I, I would love it if that happened. I, but I, I, we don't like to wait. So, but God doesn't always work that way, does he? You know, we're praying for somebody or we're praying for a situation or we're praying for a thing, and we have to wait. We don't like to wait on answered prayer. We don't like to wait for loved ones to come to know Christ. Well, you just want to, Lord, I just pray for such and such that they come to know you, and boom, they're saved. We love that. But we don't like to wait. But here's what he told them. He said, you need to wait. You need to wait on the promise. He said, John baptized with water. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to be baptized with the Spirit. And they needed to wait. And you know, for you and I have to live for God. To do what God wants, to, to follow his example for the church, we also need the promised one. We need to wait. We can try to serve God without the Holy Spirit, but it's not going to work. We can feel good about ourselves for a little bit, but, but we have to have that Holy Spirit. So we also need to wait. And, and the believers were to, to go to Jerusalem and wait on the promised Spirit. You know how long they had to wait Ten days. I don't like to wait for three cars in the check in drive through line. They had to wait ten days. You know how hard that was? You know how tempted we would be in that situation? You know, hey, I, about day six, I'm going home. I can't tell. I got things to do. I, I'm going to go. I, I just, I'm going home. And I know many of us would try to do that. But they went and they waited for 10 days. And as we look through the story, we believe that during those 10 days they prayed and they worshiped God. And throughout this series, throughout the, the book of Acts, we're going to see all kinds of things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. We're going to, we're going to talk about being filled with the Spirit. We're going to talk about the power of the Spirit. We're, we're going to talk about all kinds of things about the Holy Spirit. But you know the first one's easy. The first one is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's the, the time when the Holy Spirit... God's Spirit comes to live inside the believer. And you know when that happens? The very moment that we believe on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The, the very instant that we believe on Him for our salvation, God promises His Spirit comes to live inside of us. So the good news is we don't have to wait 10 days. But we must know that the Spirit is in us before we go forward. To serve him. So well, they had to wait. And, and, and once the Holy Spirit comes, then they can serve. So the third thing that we see from this church is, is now they have the Holy Spirit, then they, they can witness in his power. So as we go through the passage, verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. Then you will be my witnesses to testify about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now, he says, when you receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. You know what? When the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, that moment you believe on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, to live inside, and, and let me tell you something awesome. God doesn't just give us a portion of his Spirit. God doesn't just say, oh, there's a hundred believers in Old Fields Baptist Church this morning, so I want to give you one one hundredth and you one one hundredth. God gives every single born-again believer all of his spirit to live inside of us. So, so once that happens, we have the power. We have the power to do whatever God wants us to do. We have the power to go and be his witnesses. And God is going to lead us to do things we never dreamed possible. The awesome thing about the spirit of God is it enables us, it empowers us to do stuff that we can't do on our own. So, we witness with his power. And he tells us what God wants to do. He wants us to be his witness. We can try to excuse all day that we know oh, God wants me to do this, and God wants me to do that. And God. But the biggest thing, God says, you will be my witnesses. And he gives us that, that place where to be his witness. In Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all Samaria, and, and to the ends of the earth. We're to be his witness. So we say, okay, what is a witness? If we have to ask, what, is a witness? What, is, what does God want me to do? A witness is just somebody that tells what they've seen, what they've heard, or what they've experienced. I mean, if you think about it in the court of law, 
a witness in the court of law is going to tell what they've seen, what they've heard, or what they've experienced. God says, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses. So all God wants us to do is tell the story of what we've seen, what we've heard, and what we've experienced. We can't tell about Jesus until he lives in us. So once we do, we can be his witnesses, and we can tell about it. Now I know as I say that, there's folks right here this morning that's going, I can't do that. I can't tell. I'm shy. I'm backward. I don't talk to people. I don't like people. I don't know people. I, I, I'm not going to, I just don't think I can be his witness. Well, let me show you four things that we find right here about being his witness. And the first is we have the right message. And, and as we look at that message, Jesus says, you will be a witness unto me. Jesus is our message. Hey, and, and he entirely alone is our message. That's what he wants us to be a witness of. And when we realize we can't do it ourselves, we can't save ourselves. I was very blessed. I grew up in a home that went to church. All my life, I went to church. If the doors was open, the Howards were there. We were there on Sunday morning. We were there on Sunday night. If there was a Sunday night service, we were there midweek. If there was a midweek service, we were always there. I knew all about going to church. Not only did we go to church, but I lived in a Christian home. My mom was a born-again believer. My dad was a born-again believer. Uh, so I, I knew all about living in a Christian home. Growing up, I can tell you, I was a good person. You know, compared to some of my friends, I was a really good person. And, and I looked at that, and, and you know, so, so all the things that I helped my neighbors, I did good things. You know, nobody ever told me I could get paid for shoveling snow. Yeah, I, I didn't learn that until later in life. I could have got paid for it. I wouldn't did it for free just because it needed to be done. I was an extremely good person. But you know what? I always knew there was something missing. Even though I was a good person, I went to church and lived in a Christian home, but there was something missing in my life. So something that I knew that should be there, but it wasn't. When I was 19 years old, I had a life-changing I realized that night that there was a God who loved me so much, he sent his son Jesus to die for me. He sent his son Jesus to pay a price I couldn't pay. Because honestly, if I were to die in my sin, I'd be eternally separated from God. I couldn't give myself eternal life. If I didn't know Jesus and I were to die, that would be it. I was due for a devil's hell. Because I couldn't save myself. And I realized that night, it was not about me. All I had to do was believe. Believe on Jesus Christ and, and I could be saved. So the story's not about how Dan Howard saved himself. Because friends, I didn't save myself. There's absolutely nothing I could do to save myself. But you know what Jesus did? My story's about what Jesus did. And this is a story of how Jesus loved me so much that he left heaven. All the splendor of being on the throne in heaven, he left heaven and came to earth to become a man. And he lived and he breathed and he walked and he taught and, and he lived on this earth for 33 years. And then one day, he willingly took upon himself all of my sin. I don't understand how that happened. But he willingly took upon himself all my sin and died on the cross to pay the price so that I could believe on him and have eternal life. We have the right message. It's the message of Jesus. The second thing we see from this is we not only have the right message, we have the right method. We're to be his witness. We're to be that one that tells what we've seen, what we've heard, what we have personally experienced. We don't have to make up a story. If we've been born again, God has saved us. And our witness, our message, is exactly what happened to us. Not only the right message and the right method, but we have the right mindset. Notice where he tells us to be his witness. He says, and when you receive power from the Holy Spirit, you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I know when I first read that, I thought, how in the world can I be his witness to the ends of the earth? I don't know everybody on this earth. 
And I'll probably never go all over this earth. You know, right now, if I have my way, the only places I'll go is where I can drive. Now, I, I, flying is okay. I don't mind to fly. But if I'm going to fly, I want to fly to places where I know there's ground underneath me. Now, now, now this may sound silly to you, but here's my line of thought. If I'm in an airplane and I'm going to California, that's okay. Because if that airplane would crash and I were to live, I could walk. But if I were to go over the ocean and that airplane were to crash and I were to live, I can't swim. So my mind's like, oh God, I... so if I'm thinking about how am I going to be a witness to the ends of the earth, I'm thinking I can't do that. But what did he tell us? He told us that you will receive power. And I know some of you are thinking, I'm not going to Africa. I'm not going to Europe. They're weird over there. And I'm definitely not going to the Middle East because they'll kill me over there. And some of you are probably thinking that as well. Some of you are going, I kind of like Pastor Dan's philosophy. I can't swim either. Say, how can I be his witness to the ends of the earth? Notice where Jesus told him to start. You will be my witness in Jerusalem. Where were they when Jesus told them this? Where did he tell them to wait until the Spirit came? Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is right where they were anyway. So you know where he tells us to start to be his witness? Right where we are anyway. If you're at work, that's your Jerusalem. If you're at home, that's your Jerusalem. If you're in a neighbor's house, that's your Jerusalem. If you're at school, that's your Jerusalem. If you're at Walmart, that's your Jerusalem. If you're at the doctor's office, that's your Jerusalem. And we can go on and on because where you are anyway, that's your Jerusalem. And Jesus says, I want you to be my witness. So the right mindset is, I'm going to be his witness by his power right where I am. I'm going to tell what he did in me. But he gives us one more thing. Just so that he knows that we can do it. We have the right message, the right method, the right mindset, and the last is the right muscle. He gives us his spirit to live inside of us. How many of you here this morning are, are, are a little bit backward? You don't really like to talk to strangers. <laughs> That's me. I don't like to talk to strangers. I'm learning how to do that, but I'd rather not. And I don't know about you, but the worst thing in the world is when you have to stand up and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Dan Howard, and this is my wife, Holly. I'd rather take a beating than do that. But you know, with the power of the Spirit, I can tell that story to Jesus. If I would live to be 100 or if I die tomorrow, I can tell you so some of my favorite times in life. One of those was standing on a picnic table in the back of a pickup Surrounded with a microphone in my hand, surrounded by about 600 people, telling them about Jesus. Is that me? No. I didn't even want to go find my name, Stan Howard. But he gives us the power, the muscles, the Holy Spirit. And he tells us, You are my witnesses. So, friends, our job as, as a Christian. Our role as a church is to witness in his power. After waiting on the promise, we tell that Jesus is alive. But there's one more thing for this passage that I think is very important for us to see this morning. And that's this. Number four is get busy because we don't know when he will return. Very simple. Get busy and we do not know when he will return. Pick up at verse 9. It says, After he had said this, he was taken to heaven. A cloud hid him so that he could, they could no longer see him. They were staring into the sky as he departed. Suddenly two men in white clothes stood near them. They asked, Why are you men from Galilee standing here looking at the sky? Jesus, who was taken from you to heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. 
My grandpa used to have all kinds of weird sayings, and, and some of them have gotten passed down through my family. But my grandpa had a say, you ever met somebody that's just, they should be doing something, but they're just standing there? You know that type of person. They, you know, they should be busy. They should. Well, my grandpa had a say for them. My grandpa would look at them and say, don't just stand there with your teeth in your mouth. Do something. Well, here's what happened. All of a sudden, Jesus had told them, he said, and when you receive power from the Holy Spirit, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the, the, the earth. And then all of a sudden, Jesus just begins to ascend. And, and right in front of them, he, he, he's lifted up, and then he's taken into the, into the clouds. And he's taken to heaven. Now, imagine that you're there and then that group. And all of a sudden, he said, and when you receive, you go to Jerusalem and wait, and when you receive power, you're going to be my witness, and you're going to do all these things, and all of a sudden, what are you going to do? I hear Tina. We'd all been standing there with our mouths wide open and our heads up, but all of a sudden, there's these two, it says men in white, I believe they're probably angels. And they said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking at the sky? I love what it says in the King James Version. It says, they said, why stand ye there gazing? If my grandpa would have been one of them, he'd have said, why are you standing there with your teeth in your mouth? Do something. But you know, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Because the only promise that, that he gives here, in the same way he was taken, one day he'll return. Now, as we read throughout the whole Bible, we, we, we see all kinds of hints that, that kind of lead us to the time and, and to know. And, and I'll tell you what, as I, the more I study them, I think the time's getting really close that Jesus is coming back. I, 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 think, I think we're right there on, on, the, on the brink of, of his return. It might be today. It might be tomorrow. It might be next week. It might be, next, it might be a long time from now. But I, I think we're getting pretty close. And often... We're just standing there with our teeth and our mouth don't know. Jesus says, when you receive that power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you are to be my witnesses. That's what he wants us to do. That's the plan that he has for us. Because we don't know when Jesus is going to return. And there's a lot of folks around us that don't know Jesus. That's our fault. Because our task, our job, our commission from Jesus, the last thing he said before he left this earth is when you receive the power, means when you believe that he is alive and that he died for your sins and he can give you eternal life and you believe on him and the Holy Spirit comes to live in him, in you, you are to be my witness. Maybe today, maybe today you just need to say, God, show me your power. I'll be obedient. I will be a witness for you. But I need you to show me how to make that happen. Because I know I can be pretty backward. And I can be afraid to talk to people. And, and, and it's hard to come up to somebody, especially somebody you just met, and talk to them about salvation. But you know, Jesus said, when you receive the power, you will be my witnesses. So today as we close our, our time together, maybe we just need to surrender to be his witness. But maybe today our prayer needs to be God. I'll open my mouth. You do the rest. And surrender to him. Maybe today you're here and you're like, I don't know if I have the Holy Spirit or not. <laughs> then maybe today needs to be your day of salvation. A day where you believe on Jesus Christ and, and know that he died for you. And you can't save yourself, no matter how good you are, no matter all the things you do. You can't do it. Because everything you do is going to fall short. So maybe today your prayer needs to be, Lord, I believe in you. Save my soul. I just I surrender my all to you. I turn it all over. I'm going to live for you from here on out. And then let that Holy Spirit come and live in you. 
so that you can be his witness. The book of Acts is a wonderful story. And then we're going to have a great time as we work our way through it, seeing the, the church expand around the world. But you know, that story hasn't ended yet. That story of the book of Acts also includes you and me. So we have to ask, what's my role in God's plan? Am I being his witness? If we want to be obedient to him, we have to let the Spirit work. Whatever God wants to do in your life today, I, I challenge you, just, just say yes. We, we never say no to God, it's always yes. God, yes, I believe in you. Yes, I will be your witness. Yes, I, I will change this in my life. Whatever God wants to do today, as, as we sing, as we pray, just say yes. Father God, thank you for this day. And Lord, thank you for, for showing us the task you have for us to be your witness. The story that we have to tell, the story of Jesus. And just let folks know what happened to us. Lord, I pray for every person here today that's struggling in their Christian life. Maybe there's things in their life right now that shouldn't be there. Things that they need to change. So Lord, I pray for them that they'll trust you enough to make those changes. Lord, maybe there's unconfessed sin. I pray, Lord, that they'll trust your forgiveness enough to, to ask for forgiveness. I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling to be obedient to be with us. That today, you will fill them with your spirit. So full and overflowing that they can't help it. But let that spirit come out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just stand with us, please. As we say